Hey guys, it's been several months since I've put out any new content on this channel and I think it's about time for an update. So I've been doing a lot of work redesigning my, my home lab server rack setup here. Um, and one thing you'll notice is I have a full size server rack now. And I accidentally purchased a full size server rack, which is what started this whole redesign process. Now you might be wondering, how does one accidentally purchase a full size server rack? Prior to this, I had a 25U StarTech rack and that's been perfect, but it was kind of getting tight on space. So for the past year or maybe year and a half now, I've been just casually browsing the market on Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, things like that, trying to find a full size server rack for a good price. And it's been a frustrating challenge because nothing really comes through my area at a reasonable price. And I did come across one that was about a half an hour drive for me and I was about to purchase it. It was a Dell rack that did not have sides and it had a broken door uh, and the guy wanted 200 bucks for it. And I was about to purchase it and you know, the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, this rack is bigger than I want. It's significantly deeper than I want. It's missing pieces. It's a bad idea and it's not something I wanted to jump into. Uh, so I was browsing around on eBay and I just happened to come across a StarTech rack, brand new, that was being sold for about half price. The guy said he bought it, he didn't need it anymore and he just wanted to unload it. So I put in an offer for significantly lower, pretty much lowballing what he was asking, thinking there's no way he'll accept it. You know, we'll come back and do some back and forth. And I woke up the next morning to an email that said your order's in. So he actually accepted the offer and here's the full size rack. Um, it was brand new in the original box, exactly like it was described. So not only did I get a rack that is better than the one I was going to purchase, it's brand new and it was cheaper. So I'm glad I held out. So that's left me with a lot of free space in this rack to add more things and move around and just space them out a little better. So this video will simply be a high level overview of this rack, everything I have in it, why I chose the components I did and how they are laid out. I have all my networking equipment at the top of the rack here since it is the lighter weight items. First up is a 2U48 port patch panel serving the networking for the house. Uh, my primary network switch is an HPE 292048 is a PoE plus switch, 48 ports at one gig. And I left a 1U filler between the patch panel and the network switch, which just allows you to move cables around. Uh, they're not as tight as the six inch cables I was using before. This is a core switch. It's running as a router, so it's handling all the routing between multiple VLANs. Moving down here, I have a 1U24 port keystone based patch panel. I'm gonna be using that for some fiber. I've run OM3 out to my desktop computer and I've got OM3 going down to a few of the servers here below. I've got a nice wireway channel here and I'm gonna put a 10 gig switch down here. It's probably going to be a micro tick uh, just to bring some 10 gig support off of the 2920 HP switch. Um, haven't quite decided on a model yet. They've got a nice, is it an eight port? I think it's an eight port I was looking at. Then we're down to my PFSense server here. This is a new PFSense server from my previous build. The new PFSense server is in a super micro 1U enclosure. It's running an X11 SSW motherboard with an E3 1230v5 CPU. That's a four core, eight thread CPU. 3.4 gigahertz base clock and a 3.8 gigahertz turbo rate. It's got 32 gigs of DDR4. Very strange memory this motherboard requires. It's unbuffered ECC memory. Uh, it's actually rather difficult to find unbuffered ECC DDR4 memory that works in the server, but I managed to find four eight gig sticks. So I've got 32 gigs, way more than you need in a PFSense box, but you know, it was cheap, so why not? This whole system runs at 35 watts under normal operating load. It's actually a bit less power than my previous setup. Now, why did I build a new PFSense server when I had just built the previous one? Well, I got new internet service here. It's one gig symmetrical fiber, and it actually tests around 1200 uh, megabits per second. The problem I had was that the previous server had a 10 gig network card in, and I thought, oh, that's great, 10 gig, it'll be future proof, right? Well, the problem is the ONT provided by my ISP wants to negotiate a 2.5 gig connection. And 2.5 gig is really an odd speed. Not, there's not much networking equipment that actually supports it correctly. So I actually went out and got an Intel X520 T2 is the card I'm using now, which supports one 2.55 and 10 gig over copper. Um, but then I decided, oh, well, if I'm gonna put a new card in, it's gonna increase power consumption, I might as well rebuild the server. And the fun part is I had all the hardware to build the server already. I didn't have to spend any new hardware. It was repurposed. Uh, this is the one new server I was using for the Chia Farmer before that has since been replaced. So like I said, this whole server runs around uh, 35 watts and it properly negotiates a 2.5 gig link back to my ONT. And then the other port is a 10 gig link up to my core switch. And in a couple of months here, we'll have two gig service available. 
which I'm told will test around 2.4 gigs symmetrical. So um, don't really have a technical reason to purchase two gig service. One gig is plenty fast, but the price is very, very enticing. And the two gig symmetrical service is actually quite a bit cheaper than the cable service I was paying from Comcast before. So I might make the jump to two gig. So this PFSense router is handling routing to the internet, it's running Suricata, it's running PF Blocker, it's running a DNS lookup, but any inter-VLAN routing and the associated ACLs and the DHCP uh, are being handled by my core switch up at the top there. Moving further down the rack here, we have my CSC 826 enclosure. This is my virtual machine hypervisor. It's running most of my production virtual machines. This is now a Supermicro X10 SRL motherboard, an E5 2630 V4 CPU. It's the same CPU as before, 10 core, 20 thread, I've rebuilt the whole thing using Proxmox at this point. I'm no longer using KVM. Proxmox seems to be what everybody is recommending for home use at this point. Additionally, I wanted to move away from KVM due to how Red Hat was handling not releasing their source code any longer, you know, affecting downstream ports of that. So the whole thing has been converted to Proxmox and everything is ZFS at this point. Before we do that, a quick look at my storage here. I have three drives across the top here in a RAID Z1 there, 18 terabytes, serving my Plex media library. Um, I've got approximately 800 movies that I own on disc and I've loaded uh, two Plex just for ease of streaming. Uh, I've got a very large Blu-ray disc collection. Far right here is a 10 terabyte SAS drive security handling my security cameras. Lower two drives here are my NAS data. So these are mirrored ZFS drives, uh, 18 terabytes as well. And then the far lower right is just handling some test data. I think we should be able to pull this one out fairly easily. So I'm running 128 gigs of DDR4 memory for the VMs. Um, again, the CPU was a 10 core 20 thread. I took off the air baffle and it's actually staying very cool without the air baffle. And I think it's providing better airflow through the case and more space just for usability of wire routing. Onto the expansion cards here. The first one is an Intel X520. It's a 10 gig NIC. I've got an LSI 9207 SAS controller. And then I've got a bifurcated uh, NVMe riser here with two Western Digital S7700s. Um, those are a ZFS mirrored array and that's storing all the virtual machine images. And then I have two Tesla P4 GPUs. Uh, these are fantastic GPUs. One of these is passed through to the virtual machine handling my security cameras. I run Blue Iris. Uh, so this is doing all of the hardware decoding of those H.264 streams. The other one is passed through to the Plex virtual machine and it handles the transcoding. My televisions are all doing uh, direct play, but any mobile device or browser-based player is gonna be doing transcoding through one of these. I've got the turbo fan uh, mounts on the back of those that I purchased from Digital Space Port. It's a very easy way to add fans to the back of these and they are providing very nice cooling. Next, we have my PowerEdge R730. I'm not actually using this for anything at the moment. This is kind of a test machine. Um, it was also used for chia plotting back when I was doing that. Don't really do much of that anymore. Um, it's sitting on some APC shelf rails since I don't have the correct rails for it. Uh, should get some rails at some point. Don't really have a need for it for the time being. The bottom of the rack is holding my chia farm. It's about 120 or so drives. I do intend to keep this running. A lot of people are saying, no, oh, well, it doesn't make sense. It's not profitable, blah, blah, blah. Well, to me, it's a hobby. It's a lot of fun and I view it as a hobby. I do not view it as a money making venture. Um, it's a hobby. Uh, my electric rate is around 11 cents a kilowatt hour and about a third of this is actually off-grid through solar. So it's really not that expensive to run. Um, I will show you how I transfer power back and forth here shortly. Uh, but this top one here is a CSC 836. It's housing 16 drives um, and it's also housing the farmer which includes two RTX A4000 GPUs. Uh, I have a video back in March how I built this whole server which I will link to if you want to check that out. I have two more CSE 836s. Each one is holding uh, 16 drives in the front and then eight more drives inside. Uh, and then down near the bottom here, I have a CSE 846, which I purchased from Digital Spaceport. This is holding 24 drives in the front and it's holding another 16 drives inside. Um, I have one more CSE 836 enclosure yet that's not filled with drives. I don't plan on expanding any further. However, just this morning, I heard that Brian, the guy that's got the 25 petabyte garage Chia Farmer, uh, maybe selling some drives. So I'm going to hit him up and see if he wants to unload a few at a reasonable price that would make it worthwhile expanding one more JBOD. But as for that, I don't plan to buy any more drives or spend any more money 
on the Chia project. So that brings me to the power utilization. And I sort of skipped over these two devices when I was going down the rack. These are APC 7750A 15 amp 120 volt transfer switches. So these take two power sources and you can transfer between those two sources uh, and it provides redundancy and it provides, you know, just backup if the power goes out. So this is where the fun happens for me as someone who, who does a lot with solar. Um, you can see I've got four amps on one, eight amps on the other. The whole thing's pulling about 14 to 1500 watts of power and I've got a total of four circuits. So this one is labeled circuit one, this one's labeled circuit two, and then each one's got an A and a B. So circuit 1A and circuit 2A are on the main grids or the, the grid power. Circuit 1B and circuit 2B are on the off-grid power or the solar power. And you can see they're both set to source A at this point. So if there was a power failure or someone was to, you know, accidentally pull on a power cord like this, you can see that when I accidentally tripped on the power cord, circuit one switched over to input B as the power source. Now I got these really, really cheap. 40 bucks a piece I paid for these and they were being sold as used. I picked them up locally and what I found is they were actually brand new in the original box, still sealed from APC. The test receipt on them was about 10 years old, but they were still brand new. 40 bucks a piece, I got an incredible deal on these transfer switches. One thing in particular I like about these model is you can set a preference. So I can prefer source A or I can prefer source B. Some of the other options on the market are strictly A's the primary and B's for redundancy, but in this case, I can set a preference. And where that comes into play is, let's say it's a very sunny day, you know, during the summer, I wanna run this off grid. All I have to do is come down here and hit this preference button. It switches to source B as the preference and you'll see in a minute, there it goes. It's switched over to source B is now providing power to the output. So not only does this provide backup if the grid were to go down, it provides a very easy way for me to switch these circuits over to the grid or solar power. Now, I'm not running any UPSs on any of this equipment and I view these transfer switches as my redundancy. There is always two power sources going to this rack. Any one of them can go out at any time and the other redundant source will kick in. When you do a manual transfer, it is good at making that, that switch when the current is at the zero position in the sine wave. Obviously there's going to be a voltage blip when that occurs and there is nothing conditioning that power. There's nothing, it's not like a double conversion UPS where it's dropping it down to DC and then back up to AC. So it is more efficient obviously because you don't have that conversion, but whether or not that's going to harm the equipment in the long run, I think is a bit undetermined. Pretty much all this equipment is a switching mode power supply and those power supplies, and those power supplies work by rectifying the AC down to DC and then switching it at certain pulses uh, to achieve the desired output. And those all have large capacitors in the power supply to smooth out that voltage. So it will give a blip it will give a blip when it switches, which is not conditioned by a UPS, but I personally tend to think it'll be okay. Uh, maybe I'll come back here in a year or two and say, oh man, I lost hard drives because of my power switching. You know, I don't switch this every day. You certainly shouldn't switch this every day. It's more of a once or twice a month or if the power goes out type of deal. Uh, but I am, I am very, very happy with this setup and these transfer switches. And I could have done this with one transfer switch. I did have a 20 amp before. Um, but the reason for using two is so I can split the load across both legs of the off-grid inverter. Uh, so these are actually on separate phases, both on the mains panel and on the off-grid panel. Taking a look at the back of the rack, you can see all my patch cables there. This is where the cable management needs to be a little bit better. Uh, then they're bundled nicely back to the wall. I've got a service loop on each side and they go out to their respected locations. I purposely put my transfer switches right in the middle of the rack. That way they're easily routable with cables. I've got a shelf supporting those cables, keeping them off of the server there. And then uh, there is my fiber ONT that the ISP provided me. Um, they basically ran a piece of hard line in and left this little pigtail that they spliced the connector on. This was a terrible job. They were supposed to put an actual box outside and then run a flexible cable in. Instead, I got the Kevlar reinforced cable directly to the ONT, which was just dumb in my opinion. Um, so you can see I actually put that on a shelf. I tied down the ONT and I tied down the cable at three points just to prevent this little stretch of fiber here from actually moving. The cable comes out at 2.5 gig, is fed back into my PF sense there, and then the other cable comes out at 10 gig and is fed into the back of my uh, core switch, the 2920. I have two of the expansion cards in. I have one card providing the copper 10 gig connections and I've got a second card providing the SFP plus 10 gig connections. Uh, once I get the new, probably MicroTik switch, I'll simply take an SFP plus uh, DAC cable off of this 
one into the switch, and then it'll give me eight more SFP Plus ports. Other than that, there's not a whole lot to see back here. Like I said, there is some cable management required. So that's what we'll call it quits here with the server rack that I accidentally purchased and the equipment that I have in it. If there's anything else you'd like to see in more detail, please do let me know. I'm hoping to get back into the video making here. I just, I don't have a lot of time anymore these days. Um, anyway, hit that like button before you go. Any questions or comments, leave those as always. And thanks for watching.